You know, why not? You see a lot of abusive relationships all the time. Once a person gets out of one, if they get back into one, they're kind of like, <laughs> what were you thinking? It's like, you know, the guy's going to keep running his mouth at the party if he got knocked out already. It's like, you know, you've seen this happen before. Why wouldn't you embrace the same model that is going to leave us high and dry? Because trust me, what? There is no reason for them to be here. I think the two reasons that they're here now is they're 24, um, they're not 24, 365 day a year growing cycles, and that if in their test, if anything escapes, it's bound by I mean, those are the clearest and compelling reasons. But once oil costs make it not, not worth their being here, they're going to leave and they're going to up and on. So that's kind of our assessment of it. Um, and therefore, we did, we were looking at like, how do we create models that counter that. Um, the one inarguable truth that oil is going to run out. That, you know, I can chart. Anybody can tell me that it's not going to happen. I mean, I'd love to hear. It. I'd love to hear how it's going to be. Uh, we're, we're going to be able to sustain this model. And in all the sustainability paradigms that are being designed, they're being designed for continents. And no one is addressing the issues of how island economies. Us, Puerto Rico, which are heavily urbanized, heavily industrialized, are going to sustain us as Cuba. How that works. Yeah. You know, and I think if you, if you are cognizant of that, if you critique it from that angle, then you know that they're not going to be here that long. In my sense. But there's another truth, and it's upon this truth that we're basing our programs and our assumptions. And this truth is our ancestors lived here for thousands of years in the forest. And given that, you know, that, that belief that we also charge people to say no, that wasn't the case. There are these huge mass of miners that came in the 1400s that brought in Pucky Island. No one can argue with that truth either. Um, and for us, that then means that they were, I don't like to use the word Hawaiian culture anymore. I understand it. What I prefer to use is Hawaiian sciences and technologies of sustainability. And that to me is what they were. When you start using that term, you, you push these practices from, oh, that's culture, that's cutesy, that's whatnot. You put it in a different cognitive category, which allows you to set a different table. And ultimately allows you access to what we're seeking power. And power on our terms for our community. Um, this, <clears throat> this, Played itself out in our, our experiment in Mott Organic Farms is based on this. We're a not for profit designed to generate revenue. Um, we're in the community of Waianae, and we're a 24 acre fully certified organic farm. We sell 35 to 45 different varieties of produce to chefs, to retail spaces, and to CSA and farmers markets. And that growing food on Oahu in of itself is a political act. To grow food in Waianae is not, as the status quo would say, highest and best use of our land. Because we have the dumps, we have live fire military training, we have all of these things, and we are one of the largest populations of native Hawaiians in the world. And those two things being situated next to each other is pure coincidence. Right? <laughs> and that's what we're talking about, this power. So, <clears throat> we have a farm. But the fact that we're growing food, and we're doing 600, this year we're, we're hitting $650,000, making us one of the largest in the world. So we're not an experimental farm, we're an actual functioning business. What makes us, you know, what is really important and, and what we really believe in is that our farm is then run by young adults from our community. We have a college internship where we recruit young adults from one and to work on the farm. Prerequisites like the 17 to 24 have graduated from high school and they want to learn the They enter into a college to, uh, college program where they put in 20 hours a week on the farm, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 4 45 in the morning to, um, to and some Saturdays when you can see the million people at the, line, um, the farmer's market in case you buy their produce. In exchange for the sweat equity, we provide a full tuition waiver to our community, New York Community College. Uh, monthly stipend starting at $500. We open a bank account for them and we match it to the one, whatever they say, up to cap at $3,000, which has to be for education. And they run the day to day operations of the farm. Currently, we're sending 40 young adults from Wyoming to college as organic farmers. <laughs>
Most of them are the first in their family to go to college. Most of them are from families where they want to stay there and they still pay your wage earners in the household. Many of them have no desire to go to college until they came to this program. And what, you know, what it is to us, I mean, why we design ourselves to function in this manner is that this is an alternative to that model. That all the things you heard about Monsanto and so forth, as a nonprofit, our books are open. Anyone can see the things. The revenue that we generate comes from the more affluent communities. It goes straight back into white and it goes back into the program. And that, what they're growing is they're growing food and they're growing themselves at the same time. And this is a social enterprise. This is a new form of business. And I think one of the most important things to know is that we're gaining power, and by gaining power, we have more deeper connections with our institutions of higher learning. Whoever is the most powerful dictates what the colleges teach, because the, I mean, the role of these institutions is to keep the state's economy going. And we're trying to articulate new paradigms and therefore getting more interaction with our, our university. We just got some data from Newark Community Colleges. Um, I went to my undergrad, I went to AA, and that, I went to the UWNL. Is that the University of Hawaii in your lungs? <laughs> 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 LCC satellite you know, um, campus on um, Wyoming Mall. The data we got from them is that you know 50% of all new applicants to LCC Wyoming is coming from our program. So if you don't think that that's not going to impact, you know how all of these state institutions are now being mandated to increase the number of Native Hawaiians going to school and so forth, that is going to fundamentally change it. It's, there's three things then that our, our program is rooted in. First is that we have to be an iteration, a modern iteration of a traditional practice. We do organic farming because we know as well costs increase, the need for more food is, and consumption is going to be part. So that's, that's going to be an emerging market. But more importantly, we do organic farming because our ancestors were the first organic farmers. And when you don't artificially induce the soil to grow beyond its capacity, that means you have to know the winds, from all the things that are problems of your ancestors. Your culture then isn't just something to just chant because I'm Hawaiian. Your culture is then something you chant because embedded in these small level and these things are scientific knowledge. And that's the first thing we're trying to do. The second thing we're, we're really designed to do is to create pathways to academic achievement for a community of youth that learn with their hands, to then working in groups, and then working on projects, tactile peer based projects. Young adults who learn that way, now in the DOE, are called special ed, and they're put in classes. And they're not stupid, they understand that that's a slave. But the damning thing is, is that that's how their ancestors learn. That is how practitioners learn. And when you tell them they're special ed for that way, it's putting them down, it's putting their families down, it's putting their ancestry down. And we are smart in the sense that because kids in our community understand power, you wonder why they're breaking people's spaces. It's part of that it's acting on them. We try to use these spaces, and they call that entrepreneurial space, enter enterprise and entrepreneurialism. We tell the same set of kids, with this acre, you gotta make $50,000 a year while maintaining two from one college. They will learn math. They will learn their science. And they have to do slow test. Marketing it, they will learn, you know, their English. When asking why more people aren't growing food in a way, they will learn political science. And they will learn more studies. And they will learn all of these things in a way that it's not just starting off taking notes and growth, spinning back. They will learn how practitioners learn. But I need it. I own it. This is a responsibility of my institution. So that's the second thing we try to do. But the third thing, and I think what Uncle Walter and I were talking about, is that you can't just use these powerful pathways to academic achievement and not build jobs. Because you're going to create diaspora. They're going to be so empowered that they're going to be living in the Pacific Northwest or wherever they want to. So, what we are aspiring to do is create living wage jobs in our own community that, you know, that honor and respect the workforce that are rooted in our indigenous practice. And that, I think, is how we, when, we, when, when Monsanto finds it, when, when you know, their PR machine runs out, they figure we're just going to pull it on. We have these things built alongside. 
I think that's the key way for us to address these issues. It's not give them too much money and have it give a whole bunch of time to respond to them. It's like basically give them an eloquent little finger to what they're trying to do and create something that can participate in the market and be better than them. Be a better brand and so forth. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do is Currently, the dichotomy of culture is, I mean, the dichotomy is in our community. If you don't practice your culture, you make money. What we have to shift it to is like, using your cultural practices to give you a competitive, a competitive advantage in the emerging ah. economy. And you have to do, you have to recreate Aina. And that's what we're trying to do. Aina does not mean that. If you break it down, it means that which means. It entails a relationship. And in this modern society, which and you have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy land here. All these things are against you. We have to indigenize. We have to colonize the colonizers and use the tools against them to be better at them on their terms. And that's ultimately what we're aspiring to do. Um, like I said, we're doing about, we're, we're going to be doing a million years, in, a million dollars in sales two years from now, sending more and more kids from White Knight to college, and really rebranding our community from a place of deficit which is a recent American behavior, to a place of power. When I mean, you come from our communities, like, yeah, that's right. And we're from this community, we grow food, we, we, we are adapting what is good we want, and we're feeding everybody. And people live in town should be happy because we're not working off your car. college. But I think that's a really important shift. And we have to seek to be, become powerful in of ourselves and not let them make us to fear, give them undo. It's a call for us to actually I appreciate your time.